<laughs> no, it's Saturday. You know, we're all out there, and I kind of just – we've all been talking about this for a while now, and then NAS made this statement. So I think it's actually good that NAS made this statement. I think we need to start talking about this. What, what do you think we're at with these interventional procedures and, and how we should scope it um, in the interventional spine world? Well, it's interesting because I feel like we have two ends of the spectrum because – Oh, we Kosla, know Kosla, we... you join in too, man. Kosla, do you know how to join in? I, we can get up to four people here because I really want this to be a good conversation because yeah. I don't know where we're going to end up, right? Let's see. Go right, live. Let's right. see. I'll try to invite them. I don't, I don't know how this works. I think it would take a minute for them to be in the room, and then if you request, then you'll be able to you'll be able to accept it. All right, cool. Um, that's what happens to me, so. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, so I think it's we, – we know what we're capable of doing, and I also believe if we, we show a lot of these physicians that – Hey, these are really safe techniques. Yeah, we're not messing with the spinal cord. We're not messing with the nerves. Look how far away we are. We can really prove that interventional spine physicians are capable of doing these procedures. Yeah, I, I think we're more than capable. You know, I, I'm in a unique situation. I work with, gosh, it's probably twelve surgeons now, and I'm the only interventionalist. And we have these conversations on a daily basis. You know, a new a new procedure comes up and should we be doing it? Should be they be doing it? You know, this is very much the interventional cardiology versus cardiothoracic surgeon uh, realm of the late 90s, early 2000s. You know, back in the late 90s, 95% of cardiology procedures, interventional procedures were done by the cardiothoracic surgeon. Now I'd say 95% are done by, by, um, the interventional cardiologist, right? And that's that's where we're at now. There's going to be this give and give and take back and forth. Um, I think, honestly, you know, here's some statements that I'll make about this. It, the last statement by Mass, um, I, I don't, I, I don't love the last line, right? Arthrodesis or any other intervention that alters the biomechanics of the spine should not be performed by practitioners trained in fields other than neurosurgery or orthopedic spinal surgery. Now, that's a bold statement, right? That that's really puts it out there that we really shouldn't be doing anything that alters the biomechanics of the spine. When I say we, interventional spine, I'd love to have an orthopedic surgeon jump on here. I know a lot of people follow us. Let's, let's talk about that word right there. What, biomechanics? Sure. If you want to break it down, like as a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor to physical medicine rehabilitation doctor. Yeah. So now – with that argument, I shouldn't be doing anything. You shouldn't be right? doing RF, right? Because that changes yeah. the biomechanics of the spine, right? So that's yeah. a bold statement, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah that, that, we're, we're picking points to be argumentative about, and that's, I guess that's not our goal, obviously. Yeah. But we want to say, like, let's talk about this. What, what is, what's that mission statement trying to accomplish, and what are we as interventional spine physicians trying to accomplish? Exactly. So, so here's my stance on it, and I, I think – and I've been saying this a long time, and a lot of people on the pain management side I don't think like when I say this statement, is our fellowships are too stratified, right? We went to the same fellowship, so we, we got a certain training. But there are fellowships where, unfortunately, they are blocked by their surgeons from doing these procedures. So they don't have access to these procedures in their fellowship. You can't have a fellowship where, you know, it's, it's almost solely focused on pain management and and injections and then the same fellowship name let's call it focus on doing i mean how many vertiflex did we do in fellowship minuteman intercept kyphoplasty right so and then those two physicians come out and have the same fellowship degree even even when we came out how comfortable were you with suturing with pre and post-op management not as good as an orthopedic surgeon right right yeah right so even Go ahead. Yeah, even in the own realm of pain medicine is like, look how many cervical things, that, cervical procedures that we did versus people across the street. Yeah, exactly. I, I have pain. that great. I mean, I don't know if anyone went to UAB, but I'll never forget when those fellows came over to us. They're like, they just weren't getting what they want. I think Coastal just made a great point there. Uh, let's work on that. Let's work on adding these therapies to fellowships. And that, that's one thing I've been talking behind the scenes with a lot of people is, do we start a new fellowship called interventional spine and sports management. You know, that's, that's what I would love. Um, that, that's why I started Meta Combine is to tell people, hey, these procedures are out there, but you need to know what you're doing before you do these procedures. You need to know how to take care of a wound infection. I mean, it's not if you're going to get a wound infection, it's when are you going to get a wound infection, right? You need to know how to take care of, if, the, every, if everything goes right, anyone can do these procedures, right? 
Um, but if everything doesn't go right, you need to have either backup with your, your partners or have someone that can help you out. So, you know, I understand where NASA is coming from, but I, I think we need to work together with these surgeons to really, and, yeah. and I'm going to make an, another, go ahead. Yeah, no, two things, because I know we've talked about this separately, because yeah. you got to want to like stick with the ACG ME around, which I'm not against. But I'm like, hey, listen, we could do the same thing. And we have another colleague that went to our fellowship who is literally doing endoscopic surgeries and yeah. more aggressive stuff that I would never feel comfortable with. But why is that not just a continuation and learning? And, hey, he's learning from spine surgeons. He's just not going out by himself. His partners are spine surgeons. They're teaching him. They feel confident. Exactly. He's going to the courses. He's he's really feeling comfortable. He's doing con procedures with spine. This is where the muddiness gets. Like we, right now, we think that our other colleague is pushing the envelope a little for, far. But um, hey, David's on. I, I totally agree, David. David, if you could hop on, I'd love to have you talk to us here. Dave, yeah. David's really right. I mean, a whole another thing that we haven't even talked about. Uh, David Lee, Dr. Lee. Um, from the West Coast, I'd love to have him hop on and talk about this because he says things so eloquently about it. And, and we need more proof, right? Our data isn't even there, right? So um, I, I I totally understand where NASA is coming from. I think a lot of people would have thought I was like, oh, this is crazy. This is this is ridiculous. They're they're just trying to avoid us from coming into their space. But I, I think we need to do it the right way. And this is what always happens with adoption, right? You you kind of push forward, push forward, push forward. And maybe get over your skis a little bit and you pull back a little bit, right? And reassess and see where we're at, see what we can do. And then it's, it's up and down. It's like the stock market, right? You go up and down. It's not going to be a straight, straight up flow. But I, I do think we need to take this as an opportunity to take a step back, talk to the surgeons and say, where can we do this together? You know, because yeah. um, to be honest, let's just take a, a Minuteman case, for example, right? I, and, and I know there's a lot of spine surgeons out there. I would say we're better under fluoro than than most surgeons are because that's what we do, right? So for us to place it more precisely, I, I think an interventional spine doc would actually do a, a better job at that. But I think we need to understand more what we're doing before we actually just rogue place it, you know? Um, I, I don't want to say rogue. I'm just saying you don't just put it in and do it like you're doing it on a – cadaver you have to understand everything you're going through and pre and post op management so I, I think we're doing a great job of trying to learn and i think just sometimes we might get a little over our skis and nas just came out to say that what do you think yeah so i think that's right a lot of it does come down to training education um i completely respect these spine surgeons they go to residency and fellowships way longer than we do. So I, yeah. I hats off to them. They know what they do. Yeah. And I can appreciate their understanding. It's like the same reason why we don't want just a general medical student who's seen two or three procedures just doing a basic epidural. Like, hey, there's a lot that can go wrong in a small period of time. Yeah. Um, and, I'm, and that's not a, a direct analysis or a comparison, but it's close. Like, they don't want people that are over kicking their – out kicking their coverage – doing too many of these, like that's another whole aspect of, hey, do I see this small spondylolisthesis or spinal stenosis, I'm going to throw it in. Like, no, you should have exhausted other measures way before exactly. that. No, exactly. We can't <laughs> overutilize these stuff at all. I think David, and I wish I could get both these guys on because they're making great points. Um, David, yeah. right. If we can get the data in front of our surgical counterparts, we could definitely help the argument for what the procedures we're doing. And the data is coming. You know, the problem with data these days, this is a whole other conversation. It's so expensive and so hard to get. It's not like 20, 30 years ago where one doc could be like, hey, I want to do a, a study real quick and even do a, a randomized controlled trial, double-blinded. A doc used to just be able to do that. Now it has to have backing of industry. And, and you know, I've talked to some industries that are in these fields, some of the SI joint field. It's coming. They're, they're working on it. It just takes time and and we have to be smart about it. You know, it has to be a, a, a forward mo march um, with our colleagues. Uh, you know, just what uh, Colsa said, let's develop an algorithm to partner with our spine docs. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I do, right? I work with five spine docs in my field. You know, different procedures, I kind of tell them, I'm like, where does this fit in our algorithm? Not my algorithm, our algorithm of Canner Spine Center. 
you know, where does Minuteman fit? Where does Vertiflex fit? Where does Reactivate fit? And we've gotten to the point where we know where these patients fit in our whole practice algorithm, not just in my interventional spine algorithm. So I think that's, you know, that conversation needs to keep happening. Yeah, as an independent physician, it's definitely tougher for me, not knowing a lot of people in the area, but I think, you know, our, our fellowship director, uh, Goodman, he, he pressed on us like, hey, listen, I don't do anything that's outside of the realm. I send these patients to the surgeon first and let them give me their blessing. Exactly. In my experience, when I see these mild spinal stenosis or grade one listhesis, um, and I send them to a surgeon, the surgeon just sends them right back and says, do an epidural. Yeah. Hey, I've tried a couple of epidurals. Now what do you want me to do? I don't want to keep bouncing this patient back and forth. They don't want a huge surgery. Um, you know, some of these discectomies aren't huge, but you know, they don't want a laminectomy. They don't want a, a massive uh, rod screws and that. It's like, let me try this. If it doesn't work, you we're not stealing this patient. There's still an opportunity for you to do what you need to do. No, I, I totally agree with that. And and you know, the the stealing the patient stuff, that that's gotta go by the wayside because it has to be honestly. And I'm going to make another, I, I, I do, I've been throwing these statements out there for a few years. I don't know if an interventional spine doc should practice without a spine surgeon. And I don't think a spine surgeon should practice without an interventional spine doc because there's this many patients in your practice, right? This many can be treated with the interventional spine, this many with the spine doc. If the spine doc doesn't have an interventional spine, he starts doing surgery too early, right? And the interventional spine doesn't have the spine surgeon. He starts pushing too far in doing procedures on people that really need open fixation, that kind of deal. So, I, I, I mean, I was talking to a surgeon in Germany who's on the Reactivate team. They don't, there's no difference, right? Yeah. It's just spine, right? It, your background might be PM&R, interventional spine, then your spine. Your background might be ortho, then spine, then your spine. You know, over there, there's there's no difference. And, and I think that's how it has to be here. And, and that's one thing I love about NAS is we are together in NAS. NAS is another uh, society that's nice that we're together um, with some neurosurgeons and whatnot. But I just think we need to push the conversation forward. That's, you know, that's what we're doing here. Right. Um, I, yeah, I, I just lost my train of thought because I had something to, to piggyback on that. Um, yeah. No, I, it, it, and we need, we need, and then David was, we, me and David were talking about this, about like even just suturing skills and pre-op and post-op and antibiotic care and do we brace, don't we brace? That needs to be a consensus. You know, I, I ask, I asked probably a hundred interventional spy guys in the last month when I've been talking about this, do you brace for SI joint fusion? Right. And I, I probably got 50, 50. Okay. If they brace or not. Now, if you ask a hundred orthopedic surgeons, if they brace for an L4, five fusion, what do they say? Yeah. All of them. Yeah, the answer is yes, right? It's not, it's not even a question. They look at you like, what's wrong with you? Why would you ask that? Right? Yeah. We, we just don't have consensus. And I, and I think we're working towards it. Like Aspen, I'm working on a best practice paper with them for uh, BVN ablation. That's what we need. Just everyone to come together. Yeah. And yeah, Posta says he doesn't brace for SI fusion. I, I do. I do brace for SI fusion. So. Right. And, like, <laughs> and, and we can both come up with 10 <laughs> reasons why and 10 reasons against, right? So. And they're both reasonable. So what I was thinking um, when I lost my train of thought is like, you know, ultimately, like, let's throw all out stealing patients. Like, no, no, no. These are human beings, first off. Yeah, like, exactly. What are we trying to do? Like, are we trying to get a better, more functional life for anyone? Then let's just throw out any egos. Let's throw it all out. Like, listen, if the best thing for a patient is a spinal fusion, I agree. Yeah. You go do your thing. Yeah. If the best thing is just an epidural block or radio frequency ablation, in your opinion, then that's fine, too. Like, I'm not... Like, we should really be considering where does, this, does the patient come it, into all this? Exactly. And, and and that's why I work so well with Jeff Kanner and, and John Ashgar in our group is is I literally have clinic next to them. Like, doors 1 through 10 are theirs and 7 – or 1 through 6 are theirs and 7 through 10 are mine. And I have a patient there that I'm like, you know what, let me have Jeff come in here real quick and take a look at it. And he comes in real quick and he says, no, he's like, he's like you could – you take care of that one first. He goes, if you need to, they'll bring me in. I mean, that's what it needs to be. It need, in, in, unfortunately, there's some other economic stresses in the medical world that are putting on that. We can't, it can't be like that as much anymore. But this field needs to be like that because the spine, you know, another thing I say about spine, you only get one spine. You know, you can have a knee replacement. You can have a hip replacement. You start 
putting widgets in the spine that, and now all of a sudden you need to do a bigger surgery. So let's take x -stop, right? For example, that's kind of by the wayside. No one's going to get mad at us for talking about x -stop. But if you put an x -stop in somebody, you have changed the surgery they can have the next time, right? So, so as far as saying like, I, I didn't do anything by putting in an X stop, what you did, you know, it, now the surgery they need to have, if they need to have a full open surgery, is probably going to be a bigger level fusion because you've taken down the tension bands between the spinous process, right? The inner spinous ligament. Yes. So we need to realize what, what the difference is. And, and if someone does just need that, let's say, you know, 85-year-old patient with one-level stenosis. Yeah, x stop vertiflex, perfect. Let's say 60-year-old super active patient with one-level spinal stenosis. Maybe you could do a dome laminotomy or, or something along those lines where we're not putting anything in or taking anything down. I, those are just the things. We, it's not black and white. That's all I'm trying to say. Well, to, yeah, to piggyback on that point is, so my QI project, my quality improvement project in residency was the – ADL changes in a patient post spine fusion. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. So we knew what realm, and you know, we we subselected fifty patients. We had a heavy spine surgery a residency. A lot of them would get them into our rehab unit. So we would see what their functional scales would change in each domain. Right. So obviously, the one that changes the most are like brushing their teeth and grooming and that kind of stuff. But the things that didn't change much were uh, being able to walk, dressing themselves. And, you know, if I do a Minuteman procedure, you know, indications are different. I'm not going to say anything against that. But, like, I do a Minuteman procedure. What are the – what am I restricting them from the next day? Yeah. I'm just much. saying, like, hey, don't go lift heavy things. Don't go swing a golf club. Don't don't run a marathon. But yeah, go I, live a functional I, I just tell them no bending, lifting, or twisting greater than 15 pounds for two weeks just so they don't hurt the muscles that I was near. You know, it's it's really – the minimally invasive world, you know, someone I talked to about this, it is, it's going to go there one way or the other, right? Yeah. It has to go there safely because we're in medicine. It's like trying to stop the internet, right? It happened. It's like, you know, a lot of things that are happening, trying to stop electric cars because of the oil company. Like, it's not, it, it's going to happen either way. The more minimally invasive procedures just... It, we're in medicine. It has to be done right. We're scientists. We're scientific first. It has to be done right. We have to strat We have to, you know, really get this teaching into our fellowships, if not even into our residencies, uh, before we go. The 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 best just analogy, and I talk in analogies a lot, a lot, is the best analogy I have is orthopedic surgeons come out of their fellowship and their residency, and they're like a thoroughbred, right? They're born, boop, and they're ready to run. We come out, and, and I don't think we're ready to run. I don't. I, I, I think we're maybe ready to run for injections. I think we're maybe ready to run, you know, for taking care of or masking pain. I don't know how ready to run we are for doing these advanced procedures right now, you know? It took me three months. It took me three months in fellowship to get comfortable with yeah. injections. Yeah, exactly. So, right? Like, and then it took, I mean, even after we left, and, you know, we talked about it this week, even about my critiquing my own technique on this procedure that we did. And we talked about it, you know, yeah. and was reassuring, like, no, and here's some more papers to go read about it. Yeah. And like that, that's what happened. It's like, I get it. I know my limitations. I, I was doing a cervical transfer uh this week. And I, I'm like, you know what? Patient's uncomfortable. I don't feel comfortable with the contrast flow. I'm just calling it. I'm done. Yeah, Let's that's, walk out. I, that's the best thing you could teach someone is know when, when to say no. Right. Know when to abort, know when to come back another day. Um, that's that's the thought of a surgeon, right? Like when when the, it's just the more invasive we get, the more you need to know. Um, and we it's a big step up in the last twenty years of this field. It used to be, I mean, even when I started really looking into pain, probably seven years ago, spinal cord stimulator was about as invasive as we got, right? There was Vertiflex was just starting. Um, you know, kyphoplasties out there. Obviously, I don't know how, like, we don't think of kyphoplasty that invasive, but when it came out and well, everyone's going to kill me because I don't know the exact, probably 1998 or 99 with kyphon, only surgeons could do that in a hospital setting, right? Only surgeons yeah. could do it in a hospital setting. Now 
we do it in our office in, in 25 minutes, right? So you have to tread slowly and do it the right way. Um, I, I think we just have to be smart about it. I think we have to take this position with NAS as an opportunity to, and there was, uh, there was a paper written, a, a, a multi-society scope of practice position statement was written on October 14th, 2021. And that was written by, here, I'm all right here, American Association of Neuro, uh, Neurological Surgeons, AOS, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, Interventional Society of Spine Surgery. So it was all the surgical field, right? And a lot of people could have taken this paper and said, this is just the surgeon trying to push out the interventionalist, right? And, and or this, this statement, it's a two statement, position statement, um, you know, very similar neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons are the only physicians who have undergone extensive training in the biology, biomechanics, surgical anatomy, and techniques of instrumentation. Everything they're saying is true. I mean, it's true. We don't go, we don't do that in fellowship. Um, but a lot of people could have saw this and said, it's just the surgeons trying to push down the interventionalist. Now, NAS comes out and says it, and I'm a member of NAS. I don't, I don't know if you're a member. I mean, NAS is probably 25% interventionalist, if not more. Um, I think we, t and do I wish NAS maybe had a little softer last line? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think we take this as an opportunity to go back to NAS and these other societies and say, we hear you guys. We want to work with you guys. Take our big yeah. societies like ASIP and Aspen and say, you know, we want to come together as, as one. And, and how do we do this going forward? Because the one thing we do see in real life, in real practice, is the patients are getting better with these procedures. So how do we maintain these procedures and not step on their, their toes and not hurt anyone? That's, that's where I take out of the whole thing. I agree. I, I, I do think, you know, my initial reaction was like, of course they're going to say this. But then I'm like, you know, took some time to think about it and like let the emotions settle, settle exactly. down. Exactly, me know, too, yeah. Coming in and talking about it and thinking fast and slow, you know, you have an emotional mind, which is first to react, and then you have a logical, critical mind who thinks about it over time. And it's like, listen, like, I'm not going to leave NAS because of the statement. That would yeah. be idiotic. Um, you know, I went to a NAS-approved accredited fellowship you know, all these things. So it's like, no, these are my colleagues and I want to learn from them. I want to see their pain points. I want to see what our pain points and discuss. And maybe we just need to change the terminology. Like, you know, arthrodesis, maybe that just needs to change to like such, not such a, you know, it is arthrodesis no matter what, but maybe there's a different term we can use. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, mm -hmm. which I don't know how much we're allowed to talk about with what happened with, with arthrodesis, with the codes, right? So now we're talking mm -hmm. codes and CPT. And, you know, that's a whole other conversation of should we be using the same codes for some of these same procedures? That's that's above my pay grade. I always say, listen, yeah. let the CMS guys figure out the codes. Yeah. I, 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 I used, I mean, I've done. The responsibility as physicians is to understand the indications for use. Exactly. Clearly written out on LCD guidelines on every procedure. So you go to that LCD website and this indication for, for use, I copy paste that into my notes and I change the terminology to fit, you know, how it, my wording is. Exactly. And, and as long as we stay on indication, we're safe. We know what we're doing in our train. Our trainings have to get, have to get a little more. Uh, yeah. uh, it has to be more, you know, this is, this is your surgical portion of your fellowship. So here's a question I'll pose to you that we've talked about. Should there be a second year of fellowship? Right. So we've talked about this extensively and, my, well, my first statement is like this, this should be its whole own residency yeah. between yeah. being able to read radiology, um, understanding complications, managing an airway, uh, post-op infections, all that stuff. So yeah. it could easily be four years and you could be a service to the hospital. But okay, so that's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, making a residency is way harder than making a fellowship. So as far as the fellowship is concerned, it should be two year fellowship. One year of just the bread and butter, epidural steroid injections, meter branch blocks of all levels, uh, peripheral nerve blocks, joint injections, and start getting introduced to the surgical techniques. Exactly. Then that's something years to be very heavy surgical techniques, post-op management, um, and maybe even flirting with the endoscopic, but you're going in the room with the surgeon. It's going to happen. The endoscopic is going to happen. My, my surgeons are already starting to do endoscopic because they realize yeah. it's it's a – it's something that is helping the patient, right? So the endoscopic is going to happen. 
it's not if, it's when. Is it 10 years from now, 20 years from now? I mean, why not? Why wouldn't it happen? If we're getting better at making things smaller, less trauma to the spine, if you can, I mean, look at an ACL repair these days, right? Yeah. No one, no one does an open ACL anymore, right? Or, or anything. I mean, a gallbladder removal, appendix removal, like all these, it's, it's going to happen. It should happen in the spine. The question is, who, who, whose field is it going to land in? And if it's floral guided, that's what we do, you know? And I, I think a mix of having the surgeons come down to our area and learn fluoroscopy, us going to their area. One thing you said that was great that I, I can't stand is the fact that we even talk about reading our own MRIs. That, <laughs> you know, you, you, if I meet someone that doesn't read their, their own MRIs, I don't even consider them to be a part of our field. I mean, we spent too much time together because you know we spent too much time together because I sent you a direct message about something completely separate about an MRI reading and we're just yeah, like it's just, kind of looking at each other. It's like it's just come on. Yeah, if you don't read your own MRIs, you know you should you should take the time to go sit with a radiologist for a long time because it's not easy. SIS has great courses. For they do. Radiology. Yeah. No, SIS has amazing. We we've kind of left them out of this conversation. SIS has amazing educational courses. Really amazing educational yeah. courses. Uh, just ready in in the the bread and butter stuff too, which you know some people forget yeah. about. Like everyone's like, oh, I want to go get trained in this big invasive thing, and I don't even read my own MRIs yet. And you're like, well, what do you do? And, and maybe that's the next step of med and combine too. Like you know, like. That's an easy one to set up. We can just spend 30 minutes every two oh, weeks. Like Super easy through the VR system, too. I mean, God, to teach yeah. someone to read an MRI, we could do that easily through the Emertech system. You know, we just kind of bring in a radiologist. Gosh, we could bring in Doug Beal. He's, he's radiology yeah. and interventional, you know, trained. He would be – and, and Doug, he could teach – he knows he knows a lot about everything. Having, and we just scroll through some MRIs of the spot, cervical, lumbar – you know, look at some, you got to learn normal first, right? You have to know normal. And then, yeah. but the fact that we're even talking about that is telling me that this, this NAS statement doesn't overstep, right? At all. Yeah. We yeah. have to know what we're doing with the spine, the biomechanics. I don't think a lot of people know how to figure out the biomechanics of the spine, the angles and everything. Blessed, blessed with our residency. Um, yeah. And, you know, in our fellowship, I mean, we had fellowship directors that were PM and R trained and, they were sticklers about functional changes and functional differences. So, you know, made us more passionate. And I was already passionate about it. Yeah. So, but we're, I, we're I, PM and R trained too, right? So we, and yeah. I don't want to, it's not a knock at anyone that's anesthesia trained. I don't want this to be a PM and R versus anesthesia thing, but we, it was just yeah. drilled to us in, in residency, right? The biomechanics of every single joint, let alone the spine. You know, honestly, the spine's probably easier than pelvis or something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, but I, I think it's – the conversation just keeps needing to happen. That's all we're doing here is keeping that conversation rolled down. Do we do we start a new fellowship? What would you call it? What would you call it if you started a new fellowship? I think it, I think it would just be that. It would be interventional pain and then advanced interventional yeah. pain. Yeah. Because then people can opt in for one year if that's all they want to do. Because there are plenty of jobs out there that are just the, hey, needle jockey. Yeah, guys, and people – that's what people want to do, right? So I like that. Maybe like a two year with the, cause, cause to create a whole nother fellowship, you know, it, it's, it's not like we're creating a whole nother monster. It's not like, you know, we're just, we're just adding on to it, right? We're just adding another level on to the apartment. So yeah, you could do the first year and be very good, be very serviceable to an orthopedic group that needs you to do injections, you know, therapeutic diagnostic injections. And then if you want to take the next step, you do the second year, kind of an advanced, you know, level of fellowship. And they and that advanced level of fellowship, that fellow could see more patients in clinic. They could have more autonomy on that side, so they can start developing their algorithm a little bit more. No, exactly. And then you're, you know, hey, we got a, a, a Vertiflex case coming up. You should come in and let's do this. And um, and then that's the other thing. Like a lot of these, these devices, they won't, certify you in fellowship you know you got to be post fellowship you gotta get five cases in the portal yeah, yeah. And I get legality liability i get it but like listen we were we were doing vertiflexes from day one in yeah i'll never forget yeah that's a whole nother story i don't want to put on here but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i did like 50 vertiflexes and then all of a sudden yeah <laughs> 
Yeah. Right. And, and fine. It, it is what it is. I understand the liability of risks involved, but ultimately, like, I'm not saying you should be certified directly, but if I have a fellowship in my second year, we do 50 Minuteman cases in that year, yeah. which would be a lot. For me. Yeah. yeah it's a realistic number um, for some practices. Then they should just go to a weekend course on top of all that training and they should be ready to go once they're done with fellowship. No, I, t- I, totally, I totally agree. I mean, uh, med ed's making a big push to at least train fellows, get their hands on it, maybe not get the certificate, but at least get their hands on it. Abbott is making a big push to train fellows. I think if we want to drop out of fellowship and run like a thoroughbred, you need to have that in fellowship. If you don't, if you don't have that, if you have this, oh, we'll train you when you're two years in and you have five cases ready, it doesn't make sense. You can't. It's like, hey, we'll we'll make you a major league baseball player once you're a major league. Base-. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You have to, you have to do it the right way. So uh, us at MedEd, we're we're really focusing on on new physicians and fellows. And, and you know what, you know what I hate to, I hate to just say we're focused on fellows because there's guys that have been practiced for 25 mm-hmm. years that all of a sudden are like, Hey, I want to do this new stuff, but, but I'm not a fellow and I'm not a new physician. How do I get involved? We say, Hey, that's what this is for. That's what med ed is for to get you a flavor, get you to understand what's going on. I, I really like Abbott is really jumped on to the training, the fellows. Um, I, you have to, you have to, if we want this to work. So mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great because like now these companies are realizing that like, all right, so example for you or for Kosla, who's here earlier, whoever, like, you know, what they do is like, hey, we have this doctor, he ha- he's trained with us, but he still doesn't feel super confident. We're going to be in the room, but we also want you to come in. Yes. And oversee it. like, dude, like right now I have the time to do it. Like if yeah. there's anyone in the central aisle that I do a procedure, they don't, I will ha- come help you out. Yeah. My expertise. Like. <laughs> For sure. And that's how it should be. I mean, even when even when you have a complex case, surgeons, they'll bring in a colleague, even surgeons that have been working for 20 years. If they have a complex case, because they here's another thing is we don't do much preoperative planning. Right. I right, do a ton right. of, Even for my interest, for my kyphos, I do preoperative planning. Shout out to Caleb Lohman if he's out there. How I mean, a lot of people I look at the exact location and angle that my trunk car needs to be everything. And it, guess what? It's safer. It saves time, so you have less anesthesia yeah. time. Preoperative planning, if you're doing an operation, you have to do preoperative planning. You have to look at the images. You have to understand where the, where the, the pitfalls are, how much lateral scoliosis, rotational scoliosis. If you're going down the pedicle for something like kyphoplasty or intercept, you don't just put the patient on the table and, and start taking C-arm images and start whacking away at the trocar. Yeah. They don't start just putting screws in you know, when they're doing a fusion. They, they look at it beforehand. You know, so I think that pre, I'm, I'm actually, it's funny, right before we got on here, I was, I'm making slides for a, a presentation on intercept at GSIP, and uh, I, my, this last slide I just sent on was preoperative planning. <laughs> so. I, and I, you know, I, I message, um, you know, I message you, I message, message Kosla, I message um, Dr. Bailey Clausen, and Dr. Chad Stevens, like, I, I message these guys, like, hey, what would you do? What's your recommendation? It's like, you know everyone's in different states, but everyone's so collaborative in our yeah. field. It's like, you know, I wish, and I actually thankfully do have a spine surgeon who's independent moving into the Columbus area. Good. And now I have another person to text. I'm like, hey, what would you do? What do you think? Or, hey, I'm in way over my head with this one. Exactly. I'm going to send it to you. If you think I just need to do blocks, I'm happy to do it. Like, yeah. And I know my limitations. I think that's what's important. No, I, I, I want to work with What's that? With them. I want to work with surgeons. I want to learn. Like- we, we have to. We have to, and we have to take, you know, we have to engage with our colleagues at NAS and at, and even our colleagues at AOS. I mean, none of us are a part of AOS. We, we, I mean, we, yeah. but but eventually the two fields are, are merging, and, and I think it, it behooves both industries, orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, and interventional spine and sports to work together for the patient. That's what really matters here. That's what it all comes down to yeah. is what is best for the patient. If you can do a, a – you can't call it percutaneous because insurance loses their mind, but a percutaneous discectomy versus an open discectomy, which, which would you do? You would do the percutaneous, right? right? So we need to we need to get together and really work together. And that's all I want to talk about here. I just wanted to kind of get it out there and, and keep the conversation going. 